Before we get to chapter 3, I have several things to discuss with you. I have some history to take you into. It's all relevant to what we're talking about. It's, it's all foundational and it's all important. And you can keep your, your finger there in Revelation chapter 3. We may even go to another, a couple other verses in some different places before we come back and actually get to the letter that Jesus wrote to the church located in Sardis. But before we do that, Wednesday night we were studying, we've been studying through the book of Leviticus, as many of you know, we've been touching on uh, specific topics from Leviticus on Sunday mornings, and Wednesday night just going verse by verse through the Bible to see what God has to say. We've had some interesting Wednesday nights lately, I can tell you, especially in Leviticus chapter 15. Very interesting, talking about discharges, that's not something that's easy to take in a Bible study. But Leviticus chapter 21 verse 1, and we're reading this Wednesday night, says the following, The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the priests, the sons of Aaron, and say to them, No one shall defile himself for a dead person among his people. And the application we made to that is the fact that we are a royal priesthood, that you and I are priests. We are priests of the Lord. If you become a believer in Christ, you have entered into a priesthood, the priesthood of all believers. And that being the case, if the priest in Israel was not to defile himself with a dead person by touching a dead person, same then with the royal priesthood. And I'm not talking physically, I'm talking spiritually. That God calls us not to defile ourselves with dead things. Not to hang out with dead people. And again, Wednesday night, what, what I shared is that so often that's exactly what we do in our lives. Instead of hanging out with those who are alive, spending our time with those who are alive in Christ, we choose to hang out with the dead. We are living in a dead world. And anyone who is living outside of Christ at this point, in this, at this juncture in their life, is living a dead life. Now that doesn't mean that you give up on people who don't believe in Jesus. There is a caveat to this command for the Levitical priest, and that's that you are not to touch a dead person unless it's a family member. Unless it's someone close to you, mother or, or brother or sister, if the sister's not married or if the brother's not married, if it's someone in the immediate family, then you can have that contact. What's the connection for us? Simply this. Jesus spent time with dead people so that he could bring them into the family, so he could make them immediate family. And the question we need to ask ourselves in our relationships outside of Christian relationships is, are these relationships for the purpose of drawing people into the family, to make them immediate family, to share Jesus with them? Or am I just hanging out with dead people because I want to? If that's the reason, then ultimately it starts to cause decay in our lives as well. So just to put a point on the relationships that you're in, if you are in relationships with people who are not Christian, who are not, do not believe in Jesus, keep telling yourself, keep coming back to the fact that that relationship is for the purpose of bringing that person to Jesus for eternal life. Now 1 John chapter 5, verse 12 says, He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. Now I start with this because tonight we're going to begin dealing with a dead church. The dead church. Sardis is the dead church walking. The dead church. Sardis. Sardis can be listed, if you've been taking notes, we've been kind of walking through church history over the past 2,000 years. We've talked about how each one of these seven churches, by way of review, each one of these seven churches are historical in content. They really existed. They were literal churches in Asia Minor, which is Turkey today, along a Roman postal route, and from church to church, these letters could very easily have been passed along. These churches existed. However, there is a prophetic element, as we've seen, to each one of these churches that is absolutely stunning. And you can place the letter, the prescription, the things that Jesus talks about, you can place in certain epochs or eras of church history over the past 2,000 years. They are prophetic in nature. And so as we look about that and consider that, Sardis would apply to long about 18, uh, or AD 1300 to the present day. This is the church that Jesus is dealing with when we deal with Sardis. The church beginning around 1300 to the present day. Now there are some disagreements on when this actually begins. We're actually talking about the church of the Reformation. Some would say the Reformation started when Martin Luther uh, attached his 95 Thesis to the Wittenberg door 
But that's when the Reformation was really set off. Others would say, no, it was earlier, and we're going to see why. Some say, I believe it was actually around AD 1350, and I'll, I'll tell you why tonight. But first, a little more history. Last week, and again, if you come from a, a Catholic background, last week may have been uncomfortable for you, but I did share back then that at least with Thyatira, dealing with the papal church, at least with Thyatira, Jesus had some good things to say. He had some positive commendations for the church of Thyatira, for what we would consider prophetically the papal church. He has nothing good to say about the church of the Reformation, which might stun you. We'll see why. But going back a little bit, A.D. 870 to 1050 is considered the darkest chapter in the pages of church history. Bribery, corruption, immorality, and bloodshed mark this time in history, which was called literally the midnight of the Dark Ages. Not just the Dark Ages, but it was so dark, it was the midnight of the Dark Ages. In A.D. 904, Pope Sergius III came into power and brought along with his mistress, a woman named Marosia, her mother, who was named Theodora, and her sister. And their illicit exploits in the papal palace in Rome, in full view of the public, along with their numerous offspring, was legendary. And it earned this 60-year period of history the notorious title of, in the church, the rule of the harlots. This is how it was known. In AD 914, Pope John X was brought from Ravenna to Rome and was made Pope by Theodora for, quote, the more convenient gratification of her passion. I think your imagination can probably lend some help to that. He was smothered to death by Marosia, who then raised to the papacy Leo VI in AD 928, and then Stephen VII in AD 929, and finally her own illegitimate son, John XI in AD 931. Now, you don't have to remember all this stuff, but again, we're painting a picture. We're trying to understand how we got from the papal church to the time of the Reformation, what drove these things. Ultimately, John XII, grandson of Marosia, became pope. He was, quote, guilty of almost every crime. He violated virgins and widows high and low. He lived with his father's mistress and made the papal palace a brothel. And in uh, AD 963, John XII was killed in the act of adultery by the woman's outraged husband. This was a pope. The rule of the harlots. The rule of the harlots. Well, in AD 1032, Benedict the Ninth assumed the office of Pope at the ripe old age of 11. An 11 year old for Pope. <laughs> my son is 15, my oldest son. I can't even imagine. He's scared to drive the car. <laughs> How'd this happen? Well, the answer is a word simony which was the purchase of position, basically. Church offices bought, purchased by the highest bidder. There was even a five-year-old cardinal in the Catholic Church because his parents had the money to buy the position for him. Now, Benedict the IX was so sick and so depraved that the citizens of Rome ultimately drove him out of the city. Clement III of Germanic descent was appointed by Emperor Henry III, the emperor in Germany at the time, as the power had kind of shifted over to Germany from Rome. And Henry III said the following, I appoint no one from Rome because no priest can be found in this city who is free from the pollution of fornication and or simony. It was so bad that King Henry couldn't even find a pope in Rome or a person in Rome to elevate to the place of pope. Midnight of the Dark Ages. It was literally the pit of corrupt financing, brazen sexual exploits, and unbelievable bloodshed. Again, why are we going back over this? I thought we got done bashing on the Catholics last week. We're not. And again, please understand, I am just sharing what is historically known. I'm not trying to point the finger, but we need to understand something here. The old saying goes this way, it's always darkest before the dawn. And the result of the Dark Ages was that good Catholic people, good priests, even good bishops in the church began to have their hearts troubled by what they were seeing going on. Began to become concerned. This wasn't outsiders who then began to came in and call for reform. It was people within the church who were seeing all that was happening, aware of it, people who loved the Lord, who trusted the Lord and wanted to live for Him, and began to say, these things are not right. A famous, famous man infamous in Rome for getting the Bible into the hands of his countrymen 
for, for preaching against the mediated work of priests. For saying you don't need anybody between you and the Lord. Jesus is the mediator. This man, born in 1329, died in 1384, was a man by the name of John Wycliffe. And I believe, personally, John Wycliffe is the one who began to set off the fire of Reformation. John Wycliffe was famous for getting the Bible to his countrymen, for saying people need to learn the Bible, they need to understand the Bible. You may recall we talked about before that the Bible in the Catholic Church at that time was chained to the pulpit. That it was not for the common man. That it was not even allowed to be given to the laity, but the priest alone knew the deep things. The priest alone could explain the Bible, and so the common people would come for worship and were not allowed to have the Bible themselves. Wycliffe said, no, people need the word. They need to have the word, and this is a direct quote from him. He said, we ask God then of his supreme goodness to reform our church as being entirely out of joint to the perfectness of its first beginning. And Rome was absolutely furious. But Wycliffe, who was uh, stationed in England, he had friends in high places there in Oxford. And as he lived in Oxford and, and worked and taught, he was somewhat untouchable. Ultimately, his friends in high places began to have trouble with this fiery preacher, and so they, they stopped having anything to do with him, and he was driven out of Oxford, England. But many of Wycliffe's disciples were not out of Rome's reach and paid with their lives. Bishops Ridley and Latimer, we talked about last week, as they were uh, set up at the stake and they were being burned alive, Latimer called out, Today they are starting a fire that will never go out. And indeed, this passion that these people had sparked the Reformation. Another historical note, the prophetic stage represented by the church at Sardis began with the fiery Reformation. This is the church that grew out of the Reformation. Now after, interestingly, the execution of Bishops Ridley and Latimer, John Wycliffe's bones were exhumed by the church. He had died by that time. He had grown sick in his old age and, and passed away of this illness. He wasn't martyred, but they exhumed his bones and they burned them to prove a point. They burned them and scattered the ashes over a little river in Oxford called the Swift. But it was too late because the spark was catching on. People were beginning to get their hands into and onto the Word of God. And any time that happens, <laughs> look out. When the Bible gets into the hands of the people, then the people begin to know their Lord and the Spirit begins to move in fantastic ways. And that's what began at the beginning of the Reformation. The spark was lit. Now, I count the Reformation as starting back with Wycliffe and with others as early as 1300, 1350 or so. But others place it later. In fact, they targeted to a specific date, a very important date in church history, October 31st, 1517. October 31st, 1517. Now, 34 years prior to this, in 1483, a German coal miner and his wife had a son. And the German coal miner said, my son will not go into the coal mines after me. And so with all that they could do, they, they got their son to the university. He went to the University of Erfurt to study law. And in 1502, a wild and ferocious lightning storm frightened this young man to the core of his being. To, to the point where he cried out to the patron Saint Anne. He said, if you save me from this lightning, I'll become a monk. Well, he was saved from the lightning. Which is why you ought to be careful what you say in a lightning storm. He became a monk. But then he became greatly troubled. He became so painfully aware of his sin nature, this young man, and so passionate about desiring to overcome it, he did some of these following things. He beat his body daily with whips until he was black and blue. He would sleep outside in temperatures below 32 degrees, nearly dying several times until other monks would draw him back inside and warm him up. He tried desperately to beat his physical body into spiritual submission. He wanted, desired, hungered for a godly life, but he was overwhelmed by the enemy, overwhelmed by his own sin. And so this passionate young man went to Rome, seeking some relief, seeking some help, looking for counsel, possibly from the Pope himself if he could get it. And en route there, in the Swiss Alps, he became very sick. And he holed up in a monastery there for days being tended by the brothers in that monastery. While in a delirious state, the monks heard him wailing and mentally torturing himself over this sin struggle. And after he came to, a monk told him what he needed to do was read the book of Habakkuk. 
Habakkuk. Why Habakkuk? Habakkuk literally means wrestler. And that's exactly what Martin Luther was doing, but that's who we're talking about. Martin Luther was in this place of incredible wrestling and struggling and trying to get things right, but he could not get things right no matter how hard he tried. He couldn't pull his life together. He knew he was a sinner. But he began to read and study Habakkuk. And a single verse struck him like the lightning bolts that missed him at the university. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. His soul is not right within him, but the righteous, listen to this, the righteous will live by faith. The righteous will live by faith. And in that Alpine monastery, Martin Luther had a world-altering revelation. He understood for the first time, it's faith in what he's done. It is not the works that I do. It's believing in him. It's his deeds, not mine. It's not about the church of continual sacrifice, of constantly whipping myself into submission. It's about the complete, once-for-all, finished work executed by Christ at Calvary. And Luther, Luther carried this revelation on to Rome. He was joyous for the first time in years, but he was shocked with what he found when he arrived at Rome. He returned to Germany very dismayed and pondered all these things at the University of Wittenberg until on that famous day, October 31st, 1517, he decided to stand up. Now Martin Luther was not known as a stand-up guy. He wasn't known as a fiery preacher. He was a very reserved man who didn't like to get up in front of people even to speak. Very quiet and withdrawn, and yet he nailed a piece of parchment on the door of the University in Wittenberg with 95 theses that were there to challenge the Pope and Rome. Three years later, in 1520 A.D., word came back to Martin Luther, a response from Rome, and it was three words, retract or die. <laughs> Bummer. Instead, he took that letter and he put it in the fire there in Germany and he said, I will not recant. I will not recant. In 1521, he was summoned to Rome for what was called the Diet of Worms, which was not a revolutionary weight control plan. It was actually a council that they had. They would have these diets. There were councils, gatherings, and it was in a place called Worms, so it was the Diet of Worms. And they realized at this point that they had a problem with this increasingly famous Martin Luther. He didn't show up to the Diet of Worms. He sent a message and he said, here I stand, I can do nothing else, so help me God. I can't do anything else. Again, this wasn't a Martin Luther pounding on a pulpit and saying, this is where I am. He just said, I, can't, I have to believe what the Bible tells me. I can't back down. And so reform, reform began to grow. People began to get on board. The fire was spreading. But Rome had its response. Now let me tell you in this history, I'm giving you a very simplistic view because there's so much that happened in this era. But Rome responded and one of the ways they responded was the development of a religious order that was ordered by the Pope. A religious order that would stand by the Pope no matter what it took to do whatever the Pope called them to do. There was an order called the Jesuits. The Jesuits which led to the Spanish Inquisition. But again, the flame of reformation continued to grow. You know what happens? You persecute Christians, they grow. <laughs> it's, it's just a rule of thumb. It's part of the deal. If you're persecuted, and Paul said, understand this, indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Why, Lord? Because it grows you. Because when things are bad in your life, and I think many of you understand this, when things are hard, you tend to cling to the Lord, don't you? You tend to hold on tighter. You tend to desire Him more because you realize, as we sang this morning, I don't have anything else. I've got nothing without Him. And so as persecution fired up from Rome against this Reformation movement, the Reformation grew and spread more powerfully even than before. The Reformers were crying, back to the Bible, look to Jesus. Men like Swingley in, in Switzerland or Calvin and Beza in Geneva, Hamilton, Weishart and Knox in Scotland. Tyndale and Bunyan in England, famous names that drove this reformation and were calling for reform. But then, in Bohemia, 1600, there were 4 million people living there at the time and 80% were called Protestant, protesting against Rome and against the Catholicism that at the time was, was keeping the Bible out of their hands. 4 million people living in Bohemia, 1600, 80% Protestant. But the Jesuits, the religious power at that point, joined with the Habsburgs, who were the political power, and they launched a brutal attack. 
Two years later, there were only 800,000 people left in Bohemia and they were all Catholic, which means 3.2 million Protestants had either been killed or driven out in a span of two years. In Austria and Hungary, early hotbeds of the Reformation, there was unparalleled bloodshed. Today, if you look at Austria and Hungary, they're mostly Roman Catholic because Protestantism was driven out. Worse, in fact, than the first 283 years of persecution against the church from Rome, not Rome as in Catholic Rome, but Rome as in the, the power of the day, it was worse than all of that early persecution against the church this persecution from within the church, the church against the church, Christian against Christian, it even outpaced the Nazi Holocaust of the 1940s. History records the Thirty Years' War, the, the Hundred Years' War, the Huguenots in France, who were a group of people that were slaughtered and crucified. And this bitterness and warring within, uh, between Protestantism and Catholic, uh, Catholicism remains today as we watch it go on in Northern, Northern Ireland. The warring and, and, and fighting has gone on so long that it's more political, really, than even religious. It's a leftover from these very times. Now, fast forward to May 23rd, 1995, in a little publicized event in Moravia at an abandoned Soviet airbase. The Pope at that time, Pope John Paul II, stood up. There was a crowd of about 100,000 people there. And Pope John Paul said, and you didn't probably even hear this mentioned in the news, but he said, and I quote, We seek forgiveness of all those who lost their lives and all the sins which were committed by the Holy Catholic Church. And for the first time in history, someone, a pope, apologized for Rome and all the persecution that had come from there, acknowledging again for the first time this happened. This really did go on. So the official position of Rome today is, yes, these things did happen. Now there's more to this story, and there's more about where this is going in the future. When we get to Revelation 17 and 18, we will see Rome itself being positioned as, quote, the woman who rides the beast. If you've read Revelation 17 or 18 and you're wondering, who is this woman in scarlet riding on the back of this beast? I believe it's Rome. Now I didn't say it was Catholicism. I said it was Rome. And there is somewhat of a difference, but we will see literally that the false world church in the last days, when I say the last days, I mean the last of the last days, the false world church looks to be headquartered in Vatican City. That's the background. That's the background to the next prophetic recipients of Jesus' letters to the seven churches as he writes to Sardis. Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. Here we go. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name and you are alive, but you are dead. Wake up! Strengthen the things that remain which were about to die. For I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. So remember what you have received and heard and keep it and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life. And I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Sardis. You may notice that there's not one single positive affirmation in that entire letter to the church at Sardis. Why? If this does indeed speak of the Reformation, and I believe you'll see why it does in a moment. If this speaks of the Reformation, what happened? What happened to that fiery flame of, of change? What happened to the church that, that grew out of those days? Why such a burst of flame and then such apparent deadness how did this come about? Sardis, interesting, the name Sardis means remnant. Remnant. It's the only time in Scripture when the church is given this designation. Every other time in Scripture that you see the word remnant used, it's always in association with Israel. And we'll talk about this probably later in the Revelation series, that there is a belief system out there. It's called replacement theology that believes that the remnant is the church, that Israel is out of the picture, that they have been replaced by the church. 
which is faulty theology. We'll talk about that uh, in a few studies, I, I believe, down the line, line a little bit here. But Isaiah chapter 10, verse 21, says, A remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. For though your people, O Israel, may be like the sand of the sea, only a remnant within them will return. A destruction is determined, overflowing with righteousness. And the Bible indicates that only a third of the Jews alive in the tribulation will live through the tribulation to be saved by Jesus. One third of the entire population of Jews. Zechariah chapter 8 verse 6 says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If it is too difficult in the sight of the remnant of this people in those days, will it also be too difficult in my sight? Which is a great verse. It may be too hard for you to see how God's going to work things out in your life. But is it too hard for him? Is it ever too hard for the Lord? He goes on and says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I'm going to save my people from the land of the east and from the land of the west. I will bring them back, and they will live in the midst of Jerusalem. They shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and righteousness. God will keep his promise, not just to the church, but to Israel, to the remnant of Jewish believers. He will keep his promise. But at the same time, there has always been, throughout the history of Christianity, a remnant of believers. Regardless of how dark the church has gotten, and, and you may even have had conversations with people who like to bring up the Inquisition, or like to bring up some of the dark stages of church history and say, well, I'm not a Christian because you're all hypocrites. Look at what the church, the church has done in history. And I say, yeah, a bunch of hypocrites, a lot of brutality, horrible sexual immorality. Yeah, it was awful. But not every single Christian was engaged in that. There was always a remnant. There have always been, since Jesus ascended, there have always been believers in Christ with a pure and honest faith, simply wanting to live for the Lord, even in the dark midnight of the darkest age. That remnant of believers eventually broke off from Roman Catholicism, from Pergamum's objectionable marriage and Thyatira's continual sacrifice. The name Sardis is once again perfectly prophetic. It means remnant. It also means red. It also means red, and the blood flowed red in those days, especially from those who would be martyrs who would stand up during this time of religious unrest. Now, as we've seen with each church, every single letter begins with Jesus giving a partial revelation of himself. Remember, we see, if you look at Revelation chapter 1, you have this beautiful picture of Jesus in verses 12 through 16 of Revelation 1, where he is he's revealed to John in all of his glory. It's the first part of that divine outline. By the way, where do you find that divine outline in, in the book of Revelation? Does anyone know? 119. Good. Chapter 1, verse 19. What does that say there? Let's look at that real quickly. It says, chapter 1, verse 19, Jesus tells John, Therefore write the things which you have seen. What was that? Jesus in his glorified state, the person of Jesus Christ. Secondly, Jesus said, write the things which are. What's that? The church churches. The churches. The church age, which we're looking at right now, the things which are. And finally, Jesus says, and the things which will take place after these things. What is that referring to? Things that have not taken place even now. Chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. That's when we start to get into the future. And it's pretty stunning. Well, back in chapter 3, verse 1, Jesus comes along and he gives another partial revelation. Just a little bit. And every single time he does this, you've got to pay attention and see what, what is that partial revelation because it always relates to the issue at hand. It always relates to what that church needs. You may recall with Thyatira, he came out and he said, I am the son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet are like burnished bronze, the God of judgment. I am judging you, Thyatira. You've done good things, but I'm judging you at this point. There needs to be a change. You may recall also going back further to Pergamum, he said, I'm the one who has the sharp two-edged sword because he would divide the church and the state. He did not want the church and the state, the objectionable marriage of Rome and the church, which caused so many problems down the line. Back further than that, with the church at Smyrna, Jesus said, I am the first and the last. I'm the one who was dead and has come to life. Smyrna, that crushed church, going through incredible persecution, and Jesus saying, hey, I understand. I was dead. Remember my sacrifice? I know what you're going through. And of course, Ephesus. I'm the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I am in the church. I'm with you. I am walking with you, Ephesus. Well, we get to, to Sardis. And he says, interestingly, 
He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. He comes to Sardis and he says, I have the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Well, what exactly is that? You may recall the seven spirits of God refers to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. It's not seven spirits that we are unaware of or, or we're going to meet someday. It's not that the Trinity is now, you know, ten people. It's the seven spirits, the fullness, literally, of the Holy Spirit. You can really read this, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, describing the full work of the Holy Spirit. The fullness of the person of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says, I've got that. It's me. The Holy Spirit, this is my spirit. The seven spirits of God. And he says the seven stars, which are the angels over each church, possibly the pastors. It could be that designation that we read about in Revelation 1.20. But mark this and listen to this because it's fascinating to me. Jesus comes to the dead church. The dead church. Sardis, you're dead. I know you, you think you're alive, but you're dead. And the first thing he says is, I have the fullness. I am bringing to you the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Mark this, the Holy Spirit can and does function without the church. But the church cannot and does not function without the Holy Spirit. Oh, God can do whatever He wants with His Spirit. And He has in the past times and He is right now in the church and through the church in the world. And He will in the future when the church is no longer in the world. His Spirit moves. His Spirit is powerful. His Spirit does not need us, but we need Him. The church cannot function without the Spirit. Both, by the way, the Greek and the Hebrew words for spirit mean the same thing. The Hebrew word is ruach. If you're spelling that in notes, just write in R-U-A-C-H, ruach. And it literally means breathe or breath. The Greek word is pneuma. P-N-E-U-M-A, pneuma. And it also means breath or to breathe. That is what the spirit does. It breathes life into the church. Without the spirit, the church is dead. Without the moving, the work of the Holy Spirit, the church has no hope. There's no life to her. Acts chapter 17, verse 28, Paul said, In Him we live and move and have our very being. And traditional mainline Protestant denominations, listen to this, tend to have a hard time with the Holy Spirit. And many of you come out of traditional denominational backgrounds, and you know this to be the case. I'm not telling you anything new here. They'll even embrace open, openness to homosexual pastors, but speaking in tongues, now wait a minute, i got a problem with that. I take issue with that. Tangible miracles of the Holy Spirit at work in a church, forget it, I can't go there. There are mainline Protestant churches, gangs who are doing wonderful things, but deny the Spirit and they will die. And we're watching the fruit of that even today. As we look at Protestantism, as we look at denominationalism, and where are most people tending to go these days? They're tending to go to independent, non-denominational churches, moving away from and out of the denominations. Why? Because they have a name that they're alive, but they're dead. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19, Paul says, Do not, do not, do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances. But examine everything carefully. Oh, oh, don't just take it lock, stock, and barrel. Examine it. Test it. Discern. Hold fast to that which is good, Paul says. Abstain from every form of evil. This morning we talked about that. There is a spiritual realm that is real in this world. There are demons. There are unclean spirits in this world. And if you're listening to any spirit aside from the Holy Spirit, it is unclean. It is demonic. We talked about, again, all these different things, um, psychics and tarot cards and palm reading and even horoscopes and all these things that people in, will engage in trying to get some information from somewhere. And either it's illegitimate, either it's, it's uh, just false, or it's legitimately demonic. We do live in a Christian, in a, in a spiritual world. And Jesus has nothing good to say about the life of Sardis, a church historically and prophetically that he calls dead. Again, even Thyatira got a commendation, but Sardis is the dead church walking. What do you mean by that, Rick? Well, one of my favorite Christmas Eves of my life, I had food poisoning. Which was not the reason why it was my favorite. I'm not, don't worry, it's sick or something here. But I, we went up to my grandparents' house to spend Christmas Eve. My grandmother spent the last 15, 16 years of her life flat on her back. She had a tumor in her spinal cord. I've never known a woman of deeper faith than this woman. But while my whole family was in the bedroom with her, where we would spend hours, we'd go to visit every about once a week as I was growing up, 
and my family on Christmas Eve are all in there, hanging out, talking to Grandma. It's where I wanted to be, but I had food poisoning, and I was flat on my back on the couch out in the living room all by myself, watching the twinkling of the lights and the Christmas tree, that pagan tree that was stood up in the corner, but no, I'm kidding. <laughs> and as I was lying there, <laughs> if you've been here the last few times, you know why, why I mentioned that. As I was lying there, my grandpa came out, a man of very few words, and he just sat down in the easy chair, and he started to tell me stories. It was the greatest night that I can recall in the Christmas season for me. I think about it every year. He started to tell me about when he grew up on the farm and his life as, as a farm boy and the things that he had to do with animals and some of it was pretty gross which to me as a young teenager was really cool. One of them, one of them had to do with how he dealt with the chickens. Oh, they raised tons of chickens on their farm and of course from chickens, for chickens to get from their little clucking state to where they're actually on the table, there's, there's a process you go through that. I never thought about that. You just go, you know, you buy the McNuggets and it's done for you. But he would go out there and he said what he did was he'd dig a pit and when the pit was dug, he would go out and in, in the barnyard there, he began to just grab chickens and he'd whip them around, break their necks, tear their head off, throw the body out into the barnyard and toss the head into the pit. Well, why would you do that, Grandpa? Well, because the body needed some time to run down. <laughs> and these little chicken bodies would just run around the barnyard, blood spurting out everywhere with the head in the pit. And of course, I'm lying on the couch here going, that's cool. That's great. And he said he's just doing this over and over. Grab a chicken, wring its neck, tear its head off, throw it in the pit, throw the chicken out there, and it'd be running around, blood spurting everywhere. Grab another chicken. And he'd talk about how he just did this over and over. And he said he got so into it one day that he wasn't paying attention, and he grabbed a chicken, wrenched his neck, tore the head off, threw it out with the other chickens, and threw the little body into the pit. And now this body's jumping up and down in the pit, you know, where the heads are, spurting blood and everywhere. And you know, it's such a dramatic picture of how we live life of how so many people will live that way dead but running like crazy to get life taken care of no true life in them but man we're busy we're looking busy it reminds me of that famous bumper sticker Jesus is coming look busy you know and yet all we really are doing is running around like chickens with our heads cut off and Jesus comes to Sardis and he says you know you look alive you got a name for being alive but you're dead look at verse 1 again he says I have the seven spirits the fullness of the Holy Spirit and I'm coming to you and I'm saying I know your deeds that you have a name that you are alive but you are dead Jesus now begins to give the corrective accusation you've got a name that you're alive but you're dead interesting the word name here is the Greek word onoma onoma why do we need to know that? Because it's exactly where we get our English word denomination. Onoma, denomination. Wesley's Wesleyans, who were later called the Methodists, we talked about that. Luther's Lutherans, Calvin's Presbyterians, Wingley's Reformers, from Baptists to Disciples to Episcopalians, on down the road to the Bridge Christian Fellowship, <laughs> possibly. Boy, I hope not. We have a name. Oh, we've got a name for our church, for our movement, for what we're doing. We've got a name. We've got a sense of ownership in our names. But how can you have a name and yet be dead? Some of you have watched this take place. You've watched out in Anacortes as those huge oil tankers will come into, into port there and, and then be filled up with the oil and then head back out. You know, those things are so huge and so massive that as they're plowing through the water, you can shut the engine down and it's still going to go for quite a while. It's exactly what happens with a lot of people in Christianity. The engine gets shut down. We get turned off. Our hearts grow cold, but we're still trucking along, and there's no life. Or another example, if it was clear out tonight, you could probably go outside and look up at the stars and, and pick out the North Star, that bright star up in the sky. And you could say, wow, the North Star is brilliant tonight. It's beautiful. It's all lit up. Problem is... The light that you would be seeing in the sky tonight, if we could see it, was generated 33 years ago by the North Star. Because of the distance it has to travel to get here by light speed, it literally takes 33 years from the time that light is burning for us to actually see it. Which means that the North Star could have burned out 32 years ago and we could still look up and see it in the sky tonight. And it would take yet another year until all of a sudden, where's the North Star? Oh, it's gone. It's burned out people living lives where we have a name that we're alive but we're dead and how about you personally are you a dead man walking are you like Sardis living on reputation 
maybe living on spiritual history, on tradition? Or is your relationship with Jesus dynamic and alive and vital and intimate? Am I living with an eye to the future, which is where Jesus calls me to keep my vision? Focused on heaven, focused on his return, his coming. Or am I continuing to look at the past? Am I continuing to live back there? You know what? We can't overcome our past, can we? I can't do anything about my past. Only Jesus has that power. But to look to the future and to look at what is coming. And give me a favor, flip in your Bibles quickly to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 and verse 1. Paul lays out a passionate plea. The book of Romans, what an awesome book. What a great layout for the Christian life. And, and Paul in chapter 5 has just been talking about the fact that, that the law was given so that sin would increase. Like, like shining a big flashlight into the nooks and crannies of our lives. Now that we have this standard, oh no, this is how bad we really are. We can see it clearly. But then he says that in verse 21 of chapter 5, as sin reigned in death... Even so, grace would reign through the righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then he says this, chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. Listen, how shall we who died to sin still live in it? Now we read that verse and we think, oh, that means that we're supposed to stop sinning. The problem is a lot of us are still living in the sin of the past. We've died to that. How can we who have died to sin in the past continue to live in it today? Oh, but, but, but look at what I did ten years ago. Look at what I did five years ago. doesn't matter. How can we who have died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism into death. So that as Christ was raised from the dead for the glory of the Father, so we too might walk how? How? Someone say it out loud. In the newness of life. <laughs> Can you just say those three words for me? Just to, so I know, I know that you're alive tonight. Say newness of life. Newness of life. Praise the Lord. Good. Verse 5. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. And by the way, I don't think that that's future. I think that's right now. I think right now you can be living in the likeness of his resurrection. You are in a body that may be decaying, but your spirit is in the likeness of resurrection. If Jesus calls tonight, you're going. You will be resurrected. That's where we're headed. He says in verse 6, Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. You don't have to be a slave to what you've done previously. Oh, but Rick, what happens if I sin tomorrow? Well, what if I blow it big time tomorrow? Then tomorrow evening when you repent and confess that sin, it's still something you have died to. This is a dynamic that we as Christians have a real hard time with. A real hard time understanding that Jesus' grace is all pervasive. It speaks to our past, it speaks to our present, and it speaks to our future. And the only exception to that, by the way, is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That's the one time when Jesus says, that's unforgivable. Why? Well, I'll tell you why in just a minute. In the latter 1970s, Keith Green rattled a whole lot of cages among the denominational Christian world. He wrote a song which was very much about how he spoke and lived his life. The song, some of you may have heard, is called Asleep in the Light. He said this in the bridge of the song, The world is sleeping in the dark that the church just can't fight because it's asleep in the light. How can you be so dead when you've been so well fed? Jesus rose from the grave and you, you can't even get out of bed. And Jesus says, Sardis, you've got a name. Denominations, you've got a name. You've got a tradition. You've got a history. You can reach all the way back to the fiery reform of the Reformation, but today you're dead. The fire's gone out. Oh, you have a name, but you're dead. So he gives then a practical recommendation, verse 2. First two words, great words, wake up! <laughs> wake up! See, what's interesting here is Jesus doesn't have a problem with someone being dead. They don't really stand for it. In fact, every funeral that Jesus ever visited during his ministry on earth, he interrupted. You know, if you realize this, the woman coming out of Nain, who was a widow and her son had died, Jesus raises him from the dead. Jairus' daughter, the 12-year-old girl who had died, Jesus said, oh, she's just asleep, no big deal. I got it covered. 
Jesus didn't put up with funerals. Because for Jesus, it was all about and is all about life. So he says, you got a name that you're alive, you're dead. So wake up. Strengthen the things that which, which remain, which were about to die. For I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. What do you mean completed, Lord? Oh, the match was struck by Wycliffe, Wesley, Luther, and Calvin, and some of these other great reformers. The match was struck, but it's incomplete. It went out. You never finished what was started. You let it all go. You walked away from it. Wake up. Wake up, Sardis, he would say. It's interesting, historically. Sardis was a very wealthy and supposedly in, impenetrable city. It was literally built on a rock 1,500 feet above sea level. And in 539 B.C., there's an interesting story having to do with Sardis. There was a king, King Croesus, or Creosus, who was in power. And at the time, the city really believed itself impenetrable, and they were surrounded by the Medes and the Persians, led by a man named Cyrus. The same Cyrus who brilliantly brought down Babylon. But Cyrus and the Medes and Persians, they besieged this city for months, and they could not get in. Because the way it was set up, it was rock walls on three sides, and in the front, a huge gate that was just impenetrable. They couldn't get into the city. They had it surrounded, and the people just holed up in the city, figuring they were completely safe. One night, a soldier up on the wall, keeping watch over this, you know, all the sieging going on below him, dropped his helmet off the top of the wall, and bang it, dang it, dang it, dang it, dang it, went all the way down and landed down in the rocks 1,500 feet below. Cyrus and the Medes and the Persians watched as suddenly this soldier, moments later, appeared down below, grabbed his helmet, and disappeared again. And they realized there's a way in. There's a way we don't know about. He had some of his men scour out the outer walls of this city, Sardis, and he found that there was a crack that led right up into the city, in between the rocks, that a man could scale. He sent a crack squad of his army up that crack and into a crack squad, into the crack. See how that works? And they got into the city of Sardis quietly, and they opened up the gates, led the entire army of the Medes and Persians in, and overthrew the city, and people were still asleep, didn't even know it had happened. Wake up, Sardis. Now, I tell you that story, but the amazing thing is, that happened in, again, when did I say that was? 539 B.C.? It happened a second time, exactly as I just told you, in 214 B.C. Different people in ruling control of Sardis, different army at the base, but same idea. Soldier up on the top, dropped something, went down the crack to get it, came right back up, and the army said, oh, there's a way in, and they went in and they took over the city while people were asleep. This is the history of Sardis. And Jesus says to the church in Sardis, prophetically and historically, wake up. Wake up, or I'm going to come to you, he says in a moment. I'm going to come like a thief. Historically, this is exactly what happened. The philosopher Hegel said the following. He said, the only thing that history teaches us is that we do not learn from history. We don't pay attention. We don't hear it. Sardis, you're sleeping on the watch. You're dead asleep. So he says, strengthen what remains. How do we do that? Look at verse 3. Look at this closely. Remember what you have received and heard, and keep it and repent. Remember what you have received and heard. Well, what is that? What have we received? What have we heard? Well, they had received, they had received, like any Christian, the Holy Spirit. You received the Holy Spirit. Well, what have we heard? We have heard the Word of God. What exactly was it that the Holy Spirit used to make that spark, to cause that first spark of reformation? It was the Word of God. It was Wycliffe saying, get the word into the hands of the people. It was Luther, and Luther saying, no more. The people need to understand this. Calvin, Wesley's Wingley, get back to the Bible. Get your eyes off the priest. Get your eyes on to Jesus. But again, why did the flame burn out so fast? Well, they had the word, but they were lacking the spirit. They were lacking the spirit. The denomination of the world quenched the spirit, and the word became dry. Let me tell you something. The reason why so many people do not understand the Bible outside of Christ is because they don't have the Holy Spirit. People will open up the Bible and read it and go, it's so dry, it's so hard to understand, I just don't get it. Isn't it interesting how when the Holy Spirit is in your life, how alive this book is? How vibrant it is and colorful and you're reading going, wow, 
I mean, it's actually exciting to set. People would not believe you guys are in a barn on a Sunday night listening to a guy rattle and prattle on and on and on about Scripture. But you got the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit breathes life into this book, and it's vibrant and alive and wonderful, and it's not dry. The water becomes, the Word becomes like water washing us. Now, the Lord said the following in Amos 8, verse 11, speaking to Israel, but it applies, I believe, to today very well. Behold, the days are coming when I will send a famine on the land. Not a famine for bread or a thirst for water, but rather for hearing the words of the Lord. People will stagger from sea to sea and from the north even to the east. They will go to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. No, instead, what we have in denominationalism today is things like, let me give you an example, the Jesus Seminar. Have you heard of the Jesus Seminar? Some of you are a little aware of that. A group of pontificating professors from different Protestant groups gathering together for this single purpose to determine the true and accurate words of Jesus in the Bible and what they did over a seven year period was dismantle Jesus words they did the following they color coded the teachings of Jesus words in black they said were not spoken could not have been spoken by Jesus words in gray they say well may have belonged to Jesus but they're suspect <coughs> words in red were the words that were authentically spoken by Jesus and after seven years of study and thinking this through in this Jesus seminar of great theologians and great minds, one sentence made the cut. Of all the words of Jesus that we have in the Bible, these guys came down to one sentence. They said, Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Which is probably the right sentence for them to, to come down to because they needed some financing for their Jesus seminar. So it makes sense. But to my mind, gang, this is far greater sin than Rome and all her adultery. What? You're saying the adultery and the brutality and even the murderous actions of the Roman church was not as bad as, as this? What are you saying? Hey, you can be forgiven of adultery. You can be forgiven even of murder. But when you don't have the Word of God, you don't have a chance. And when you don't hear the words that bring life, when you don't have or understand the name of Jesus, where's your hope? You have none. Gang, this whole mentality undermines the very thing that God magnified Himself, even above His own name. Psalm 138, verse 2, I will worship toward Thy holy temple. I will praise Your name for Your loving kindness and for Your truth. For You have magnified Your word above all Your name. Even His own name, God says, I magnify My word because My word, My word can save you. You've got to have, you've got to be in My word. Catholic, Catholicism's greatest sin was chaining the Bible to the pulpit. But you know what? At least the Bible was still being read. Why did the flame burn out in the Reformation? Because mainline Protestantism has been guilty of undermining, downplaying, and even dismissing, as in the Jesus Seminar, the very words of Jesus. And as we go about this... I you know, I've got to be careful here because I don't want to sound judgmental because I know it's just going to bring judgment right down on me. But I am absolutely stunned at how few pastors in churches throughout this area are just teaching out of the Bible. Well, how do you know that, Rick? You're always here. How do you know what other pastors? Because I talk to you. Because I've heard over and over people saying, we've been looking for a church that just teaches the Bible. And on a weekly basis, I'm stunned by that. Are you kidding me? And could this possibly be true? The first two or three times I heard that, I kind of dismissed it. But no, no, another guy's teaching the Bible. And I've come down to like maybe two churches in the entire Skagit and Island counties that I know are just teaching the Word. Oh, there are the ch churches that open Bibles. And we'll use verses in teaching. But where's the Word? What's going on here? There's a famine for the Word. And God said, For as the rain and snow, Isaiah 55.10, come down from heaven... And do not return there without watering the earth and making it bare and sprout and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire, without succeeding in the manner for which I sent it. If someone asked me, Rick, in, in two years there's been a, a, a obvious growth at the bridge. What's the, what's the deal? What's the secret? What's your strategy? <laughs> I have no strategy, no idea, except that we're going to teach God's Word, and we're going to invite His Spirit to be at work. And honestly, I believe any pastor and any church that will do that will see fruit. 
We'll see the effects. Because God's Word, God's Word is powerful. And God's Word will accomplish what He desires, whether or not we plot and plan and program or scheme and strategize or market and manipulate. It doesn't matter. We're doing all these other things in the church to try and force the kingdom on people. And God says, you know, if you'll just give them my word, my spirit will make it work. My job has never been easier. Don't tell anyone that. But it has never been easier in my life. I don't track. I don't worry. I don't stress about the right strategy at the right time, doing the right thing. No, we're just teaching and just let God do it. And he is. And he will. And it's a blessing to sit there and read his word and go, wow, <laughs> cool. And hear it, too. Hmm? It's a blessing to hear it, too. And it is a blessing to hear it, which goes you know, right back to, by the way, the divine blessing that's in this book. Blessed is anyone, Revelation 1, 3, who reads and who hears and who heeds the words written in this book. You will be blessed. You can't help it. Now, there's a huge danger in this lack of Bible reading. Verse 3 going on tells us, we're only in verse 3, Rick. Are you kidding? No, I'm, you know, we're moving along. Therefore, he says, listen, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. If you don't wake up, I'm going to come like a thief. Interesting to me, why would Jesus tell the people, think about this, why would he say to the people of historical Sardis that if they don't wake up, he's going to come to them like a thief in the night? Jesus knew he wasn't. Understand what I'm saying? Jesus speaks to this historical church 2,000 years ago and says, if you don't wake up, I'm going to come like a thief in the night. Is that just an empty promise? Or is the reality that Jesus is going to come to the church of Sardis prophetically? That he is going to show up. That there are going to be people who are stunned because he comes like a thief. Let me tell you something. We have romanticized this whole idea of Jesus being the thief in the night. But he is not the thief for you. He doesn't want to be the thief for you. The thief, gang, the thief is a threat. It's not like someone breaks into your house and you're real excited to see them. Has anybody ever had your house broken into? Is this someone you want to hang out with and have coffee? This is not a positive picture that Jesus is portraying, that he's putting out there. The thief in the night. I'll come like a thief. If you don't wake up, I'm going to come like a thief. What does he mean? I'm going to steal away the rest of the church, and you're going to miss it. You're not even going to see it happen. The thief is coming. But what's interesting is the thief is not for us. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and I'll just quickly read this to you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Jesus says the following in verse 1. He says, or Paul, sorry, Paul speaking, says, As to the times and epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. Why is that? Because he had taught them well, prophetically. He said, You yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. The thief that Jesus talks about in Revelation chapter 3 is the tribulation is the day of the Lord. He's not saying, I'm going to come like a thief in the night, the rapture, and I'm going to pull you out and steal you away. He's saying, no, it's going to surprise you and shock you if you don't wake up. But it shouldn't. You realize that there's not a Christian alive who should be surprised at Jesus' return? Who should be shocked? Whoa, what's going on here? Oh, I, I don't, this is not good. No. We should be going, this is it. We're going. All right. Forget the shoes. We don't need them. This is good. You yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. But they are saying, while they're saying, peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly, like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. But he says, and listen to this, you brethren are not in darkness, that the day would overtake you like a thief. You are not the recipients of a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So let us not sleep as others, but let us be alert and sober. Jesus says, wake up, Sardis. Paul was in Thessalonica, by the way, three weeks before he had to leave there. One year later, he wrote this letter, 1 Thessalonians, and sent it back to the church in Thessalonica. And he is talking about deep, powerful, prophetic things and saying, you guys remember this. We talked about this. Which means in that short three-week stay, Paul focused with a brand new fledgling group of believers. He focused on Bible prophecy. That's where he started. It wasn't for the mature believers. It was for the beginners. So if you feel like a beginner in this stuff, praise the Lord. That's right where you ought to start. Chuck Missler says often, and I agree with him, if you're going to start off a new believer with any book in the Bible, start him with Revelation. Man, start him off with some hope. 
some excitement, some focus on where we're headed. But the event, again, spoken of by Jesus when he says, I will come like a thief, is not the rapture. It's the tribulation that will catch many in the church by surprise. I have um, a subscription to uh, Israel My Glory magazine, which is a great magazine, by the way. I highly recommend that you get. Um, it's really inexpensive. And you can get it through friendsofisrael.org, foi.org. For uh, Israel, my glory. But there was one magazine that they sent out, and it was a really kind of startling picture on the front of it, uh, a painting of a real traditional-looking church building, had the stained glass, the pews, the whole nine yards, and there were scattered throughout the church probably 20, 30 people in this large building, and then a lot of clothes that were just lying around. And those who were left were looking around stunned because Jesus had come like a thief in the night. And they were left to deal with that aftermath. And I saw that picture and I thought, is that really going to happen? And I think the reality is yes. That there will be people in churches across America, in this world, who will be shocked that Jesus came. You don't wake up, I'm coming as a thief in the night. But the thief is not for you. By the way, interesting, most mainline Protestant churches take an amillennial Perspective. In other words, they don't believe in the thousand-year reign of Christ. They believe it's, a, it's a, an allegorical, metaphorical thing. They take an alleg allegorical position on the book of Revelation. They don't believe in a rapture. They don't believe in a literal kingdom on earth. All of these things that the book of Revelation unveils and reveals to us, church is dead. Signs of a dead church. Paul says the warnings of the thief, again, are not for the people of the light. For those who are awake, the thief is for those who are asleep. But even after the flames and the Reformation, some prefer the Dark Ages. So Jesus gives an eternal motivation. Verse 4, he says, But you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. This is interesting to me. The word people translated here is not people, it's names. It's the same word that we saw for denomination before, onoma. You have a few onomas in Sardis. You have a few people with a name in Sardis. But the people who have this name for themselves in Sardis is not their denomination. It's not that they're Lutheran or Presbyterian or Calvinist or Methodist or, or, or Bridgian. <laughs> the name that these few people have who are worthy, by the way, the name is Christian. The name is Jesus. Acts 4.12, there's salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. There are a people in Sardis. There are a people, and you know them, scattered throughout mainline denominations, in denominational churches who are bright and vibrant, and they're alive. Why? Well, they're probably in the Word, and they probably have a great working relationship with the Holy Spirit. And right there you have people who are alive, who cling not to the name of their particular church, or their tradition, or their background, but they cling to the name of Jesus Christ. His is the name we cling to, and no other. Verse 5, He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels, which raises a difficult question. Can someone's name be erased, blotted out of the book of life? Jesus said this, not me. Jesus said, If you overcome your clothed in white garments, and I will not erase your name from the book of life, which presupposes that erasure can happen. That a name can be blotted out. How does your name get put into the book of life in the first place? Believing in the name. Putting your faith in the name. Your name is in the book of life. And if your name is in the book of life, done deal. You're saved. Your judgment day happened at the cross. You are good to go if your name is in the book of life. But can a name be blotted out? Apparently it can. And you may say, well, Rick, don't you believe in eternal security? Absolutely I do for me. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to be there. What do you mean? Okay, because I know the name that will get me in. Don't you love name dropping in our world? Yes, well, I was... Uh, I was in such and such with so and so. I, I was in, I gotta share this story. I was in uh, Starbucks in Anacortes about three years ago. And I was sitting there with my brother, another pastor, some people on a Sunday morning. We were getting coffee. And in walked, uh, what was his last name? I'm gonna forget now. I'm telling you about a name, and I can't remember his name. Tom Skerritt. Those of you, yeah, you remember. Tom Skerritt walked in. 
Tom Skerritt, you know, from, from uh, Top Gun, the commander, he was the husband in Steel Magnolias, the Top Gun, he was really cool, you know, in that movie. He comes walking in, he's got two or three people with him, walks right by us, and we're sitting there going, wow. One of the guys we were with goes, hey, should we go talk to him? I'm like, you don't even know him. Well, you may know him, but he doesn't know you. Don't be a weirdo. Just shut up and watch, you know? <laughs> what was funny is that morning, we got to church, and my brother stood up, and he goes, this morning at coffee, we saw Tom Skerritt. And he came walking up and stopped and turned and looked at us. And he's lying through his teeth, but nobody knew that. He stopped and looked at us, and he said, Fidalgo Community Church, right? And everybody in the church just went, whoa. <laughs> and Ron said, now wouldn't that have been great? <laughs> but it made such a powerful point. I'm sitting there watching this whole thing and I'm laughing at what Ron said. And I'm looking at the people and going, we're so impressed that Tom Skerritt, big deal. He's just got a name. I know Jesus Christ. I know Jesus there's a name you can drop. I can go anywhere and say, hey, by the way, you know, I'm, a, I'm connected to the master of the universe, the all-being, you know, the almighty God. I know him personally. We hang, the two of us. Jesus Christ, I know the name that's going to get me in. And Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, verse 32, Everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. Confess my name, drop my name, say my name. I'm going to do the same for you. But he does say, whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Oh no, I've denied Jesus. So did Peter. It's okay. But do yourself a favor and start to confess his name. Repent if you have turned from Jesus. And then let the dead stuff lie and move forward in life. Now watch this. Jesus said, He who overcomes will be clothed with white garments. What are those? Revelation 19.8 tells us specifically. It was given to her, speaking of the raptured church, it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Uh-oh. The righteous acts of the saints? Yeah, that's what it says. And I looked up the word acts in the Greek. And the literal definition of the word acts in the Greek is acts. <laughs> it's the righteous works of the saints. It's the things that the saints did. And I read that and I go, wait a minute, what about grace? You're telling me I'm dressed in this, in this white garment, this beautiful white garment. He who overcomes will be clothed in white, in this fine linen, bright and clean. But, but the fine linen represents all the righteous acts of the saints. How does that work? What are they? Oh, I love this. This always just pops such a, a hole in the legalistic balloon. John chapter 6, verse 28. They said to Jesus, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God. Are you ready? Here it is. I'm going to lay it out for you. Get out your pencils and pens. Take notes. This is big. Here's the work of God. Believe in him and him who he sent. What? How is that? Working the works of God. Just do it. You believe in Him. Believe God. And you believe in me, Jesus Christ, whom He has sent. That's working the works of God. You know what's amazing? The people who have the greatest faith also tend to have the greatest works. It's not the other way around. The works don't get the faith. The works don't get the salvation. But once you have the salvation, once you are living in grace, man, are you compelled to live for Christ or not? Of course you are compelled to work the works of God because of your belief. It flows out of your belief. Habakkuk 2, 4, the righteous will live by faith, not by a name, not by a church. And by the way, let me say this very clearly, a church can never save you. Your connection to a fellowship, to a denomination, to a tradition will not get you into heaven. But Lord, Lord, I was a Methodist. Goody for you. Do we have a relationship? But Lord, I was raised a good Catholic. Terrific. Do you know my name? But Lord, I was Presbyterian my whole life. Great. Did you walk with my spirit? Do you know my name? The righteous will live by faith. Let me tell you one last thing. We'll finish up here. There's an unfortunate pattern in church history. 
And we've already been watching this take place. You know, from the, the Ephesian church at the very beginning, that church that was really into their works and their deeds, but they lost their first love. And so Jesus sends them into the fire of persecution for 283 years. They are persecuted, and it's difficult, and it's hard, and they're crushed. But they are offering up a sweet scent, and the church spreads like wildfire. But then the church marries the state, Pergamum, in an objectionable marriage. And the whole thing started to get watered down and political and ugly, and paganism began to seep into the very realm of the church itself leading men to Thyatira and the papal age, and then the church began to become very legalistic and exacting and demanding that you work the works, not the works of God, not the works of faith, but you do the works, and if you don't, you won't get into heaven. And by the way, if you're not a Catholic, you won't be saved, because the church saves you. Well, following that, then we see this, this rumbling, this reformation. The fire explodes. It starts to go so well. And then the word just kind of gets lost, left on the counters, gets dusty. And the church begins to fall apart. In every situation, gang, God always starts these movements in the church. He always starts with a man. You can trace it down through history. He will raise up someone who has a voice. It might be a Martin Luther. It might be a John Wesley. But he'll raise up a man. And from that man will suddenly come a ministry. And people will be drawn to that and excited about it and connected to it. And that ministry then eventually becomes a movement. And that movement grows and spreads. And everybody involved in the ministry and who knew that man and who knows what's going on, they love it. Oh, it's so exciting. It's so wonderful. It's so powerful. And the movement then eventually becomes a machine. Well-oiled, functioning, chugging along, doing the work. The programs are all in place. And if you take the programs from this church and you just take them and put them over here, then it's going to do the same thing. And how often do churches do that? Well, it works there. So we'll just take their program and we'll plug in their program and we'll stick it over here. It's going to do the same thing. And it does it. We go, oh, I don't understand. It's not as well-oiled as it was over there. Well, the machine ultimately becomes a monument. We have to do it this way. This is the way we do it. Oh, this is where the movement began. We have to continue down this road, and the monument eventually becomes a mausoleum. And the church is dead. And the movement is history. So how do we avoid falling into this trap? One verse, and I'll let you go. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. Paul says the following, If you have been raised up with Christ... Keep seeking what? The things that are above. Don't you seek the things that are below. Don't worry about the stuff that we tend to worry about Wednesday night. I said the dead things. There are all kinds of things churches worry about and stress over, and they are dead. And if they're not dead, they're going to be. They're going to burn. No big deal. He says if you've been raised up with Christ, you seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the things of the earth. He says, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with Him in glory. And it's been said especially of those Christians that really take after the prophecies of Revelation and look toward the end times and are excited about Jesus coming. It's been said of that type of person that you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. And I submit to you the opposite, that to be of any earthly good to the Lord, you've got to be heavenly minded. You set your mind on the kingdom of God. And he will do miraculous and marvelous things. Don't focus on a man. Don't focus on a ministry, even a movement. Don't get into that. All that stuff is going to pass. All of it will move on. Man, how many times, just in my short time in ministry, I can't tell you how many buzzwords there have been about this is the thing to do for your church. This is the new thing. Let's not get stuck on movements that may work so well for someone somewhere else. Let's focus on the Holy Spirit. Let's drop the name of Jesus everywhere we go, and let's keep our eyes fixed on heaven where we are headed. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And Father, we want to hear you. God, we want to be fired up. We want to be alive. We do not want to fall into the mausoleum of dead churches. Father, there are too many churches that are just functioning in the past clinging to old dead things. 
And Father, I think that many of us fall into that trap in our personal lives. Living with the dead things in the past. And so God, I just pray that you'd wake us up. I pray for the church. I want to see the church reignited. I would love to see, Father, lost all throughout this region, this nation, this world, just rushing into your arms. But, Father, it all starts with us individually in our hearts as well. Lord Jesus, we pray to you tonight. If there's a one of us here who is lingering in the past, clinging to dead things which cannot save us, God, break us free from those chains. Release us to walk in newness of life, hungering after your word and thirsting heavily after your Holy Spirit. Keep our eyes fixed on heaven where we plan to make our home with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, this is Pastor Rick. In the Bible study you've just heard, I mentioned that I'd make some comments about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit and what that meant. Here you go. I said that the one unforgivable sin was the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And Kevin just reminded me, I never told you what that had to do with specifically anything and why that was the unforgivable sin. My take on that is very simply this. The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is unforgivable because when you call the Holy Spirit something that He is not, which is what the blasphemy is, when you say that the Holy Spirit is not God, what you're doing is you're acting in such rebellion to the Lord Himself that there is no saving you. You have made a decision to walk away from the Father, to reject anything that can save you. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is so intense that it comes from a heart that says, I no longer will have anything to do with you, Lord. And in that case... It's unforgivable because you can't be saved when you don't want to be. And the Lord actually, strange as it may sound, respects that decision even in a person who says, I don't want any part of you. I don't want to be saved. I don't want to have anything to do with you. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus says, you cannot be saved.